Good morning. My name is Liz Tips, and it is my privilege to be the liturgist for this month of January. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you this morning. We would also like to welcome those who might be listening to us on Channel 6. If you'll notice on the back of the bulletin, there are announcements, and there was one that was missed. Um, beginning Monday at 9 o'clock, there is the Women's Bible Study here at our church. And um, Victoria would like to remind us that there are still plenty of times to help with the youth meals, and there is a sign-up sheet uh, in the foyer if you would like to sign up. And Mr. Lyles? Thank you. I would also like to take this time to probably more so reintroduce. The speaker today is Dave Anderson, and I believe many of you probably know him. He is the CFO of the district, and his lovely wife, who is not here today, is the district secretary. So they are also uh, good long-term friends of Tom and Rhonda's, so we welcome him heartily and appreciate him speaking today. Any other announcements? Would you please bow your head with me? Dear Father, thank you for bringing us each safely to this place. As we gather, remember those who are not with us. For the sick, we ask for comfort. For those away, we ask for your blessing. We invite the Holy Spirit to move freely among us. Equip us, challenge us, Comfort and teach us. Father, as we meet, we may encounter your grace. We ask all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing hymn 139. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, verses 1 and 2. Oh. Children are joining Sally here at the front. Children. So I have a question before I start. Are you preaching on Micah 6 8? Mm -hmm. Cool! You know what? I woke up this morning and I was going, What am I going to do children's time on? And the first thing that came through my head was love, mercy, seek justice. And walk humbly with your God. So don't tell me God doesn't talk to you when you need help. Amen. Just say it. 
Yeah, it is. Okay, how are y'all? Good. So, Mr. Ant Reverend Anderson is going to talk about my favorite verse in the Bible because I really think if you think about it, it sums up the whole story. I've got something there and you're going to have to be patient and wait. <gasps> oh, no. That's terrible, isn't it? <clears throat> Good for you. So, the first thing it says is we're supposed to seek justice. That means we're supposed to do what's right. All the time. Not just every once in a while when it suits us. Every time. The next part of it says we're supposed to love mercy. Mercy means we're supposed to give everybody else, we're supposed to forgive others. Good for you. I hope you keep doing that because it gets harder and harder and harder. Every single day, that's good. And the last part says we're supposed, this is the part that gets us every time. Walk humbly with your God. It doesn't just say walk with your God. It doesn't say run ahead of him and ask him to keep coming and following you. It does not say go along until you need him and then ask, drag him along with you. It says that you have to be humble. That means you have to do the following. You have to put God First, oh my gosh, that's kind of hard. So I kind of think this ball here is part of that equation. Is there a beginning to this ball? Is there one place you can point to where this ball starts? One little spot you can point to. So point to that spot. No, you can't, can you? Because it's all the same. Can you point to a spot where it ends? No, it's just, there it is, right? Well, the Bible also tells us that Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. In English, we'd say, we'd say he's the A and the Z, which means he's these, uh, probably, rubber, which is a kind of plastic. I mean, you know, it's all the world is plastic these days, you know. <laughs> No, nope, it will not. It will not. You cannot break Jesus. People have tried, but it just doesn't work, does it? Yeah, you can with kryptonite. Jesus has no kryptonite. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure you can. All you have to do is turn off his suit. Oh, there is no stopping God or Jesus, though. He's, because God and Jesus are the beginning of everything and the ending of everything. Everything is all about God. So when you walk with God, you can't go ahead of him. You can't go behind him. You have to always be touching. Because if I don't touch this ball, what's it going to do? Chuck, what's it going to do? It's going to go away, isn't it? Huh. But you know, the truth is, it's that we go away from God. God doesn't go away from us. So the, if I, as long as I'm touching and in hold of God and walking humbly, he's there. And I can follow. Is that ball magic? Nope. There is no magic. I hate to tell you that too, just like there's no Iron Man. Okay, let's say a prayer. God, help us to remember to always be near you and touch you and be humble and walk with you. Amen. Amen. There you go. Would you like one for your little brother? Or is it too little for him to put you on? That's what I got. Okay. One. Okay, you got one. No, you got one. He's right here. He can get his own. Don't put it in your mouth. There you go. <laughs> Any celebrations or praises this morning? I've got one. I've got one. Come on. So, ah, we got to get as far away from each other as we can. Otherwise, we'll uh, blow everything up. Uh, we uh, last yesterday. I almost said last evening. That's not how you say that. Yesterday, 
evening uh, was the last round of the uh, all-state auditions for the state of Texas. Uh, Canyon High, who I teach voice for, had I think 22, 23 students go. Uh, we had seven make it. Six of those are students to take with my voice teacher, and one of those was one of my kids. And so we're really proud of them. And they did a great job this thing. So. just want to praise God for answered prayers. Amen. I also want to thank God for my dad fell two weeks ago Sunday in the bathroom on a tile floor and cracked his head really bad. Had a brain bleed, but he is doing fine. He is back home, and uh, Mom's glad to have him there. So we praise God for healing that has happened there. be able to hear me, but um, thank y'all very much for all your prayers. Tom's home. He's doing pretty good, and um, um, if we can just get that knee to bend him, we'll be okay. <laughs> God is good? All, all the time. time. All the time. God, God is good. good. All right. Uh, as Terry's making her way back, can you please stand as we sing him 451, Be Down My Vision. We'll sing all three verses. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart, nor be all else to me save that thou art. Though my best walk by day or by night, waking or sleeping. Come down, fountain, come down. Fountain. Mountain, fixed upon it, mountain of God. 
This morning, the scripture comes from the Old Testament, the book of Micah. Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. Micah is having, uh, if you will, a conversation between uh, the people of Jerusalem, and then he responds with what God is uh, telling him. So the people say, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And Micah says, no. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. You may be seated. If you'll join me for a time of prayer. Father, I pray. I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be found acceptable to you and in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. And I pray that if somehow these words become mine and not yours, that you will hide me behind the cross. And I pray that this time will be used to your honor and to your glory. And I pray all this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. I think before we begin, uh, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, remember and lift in our hearts and our prayers the first responders in Lubbock who were killed yesterday uh, in the line of duty, uh, a fire fire person, a fire personnel and a police person, and then uh, they were killed in a uh, 
and another one, as last I heard, is in critical condition. So we lift them in our prayers, and it certainly breaks our hearts that there are two families who are grieving and trying to come to grips with this tra tragic loss. And while that all is true, I, I, what is else is true is that we are Easter people. And we know that the tomb was empty. And we know that this life is not all there is. So we take great comfort and solace in that. So, again, I'm Dave Anderson. Uh, some people tell me I'm better looking than Tom. You probably would know that it's not Tom here. Actually, nobody tells me that. Uh, and, and you probably also would know that uh, I, I'm not Tom because I don't have any hair, and, and Tom does. So uh, uh, I am uh, the uh, CFO of the uh, Northwest Texas Conference. I'm an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, and it's just really a pleasure. I, I, I always enjoy coming here. It's been a while since I've been here, but it's good to see old friends and to meet some new ones. So thank you for, for having me. It, it's, it's good to be here. You know, this is the second Sunday in January, right? And, and you know, for me, it's kind of a melancholy time because, you know, all the, it seems to me, all the good stuff is kind of behind us, right? We had Advent, and then we had Christmas, and New Year, and Epiphany. All, that's, all that stuff's in the rearview mirror, and all that I can see in the windshield, at least for the near future, is just the winter doldrums. You know, so I'm kind of a little, I don't know, just melancholy, I guess is the right word. So we have all the good stuff in the, in the rearview mirror. But let me tell you, do you know what else is in the rearview mirror? Our New Year's resolutions. <laughs> I don't know. Do you, do you make New Year's resolutions? Uh, a lot of people do. Uh, I'll give you, uh, if you will, uh, you know, the top 10 New Year's resolutions. Most, most Americans say they strive to do one or more of these things. And I'll bet you can guess the first one or two, whether you get in the right order. Number one is exercise more, and number two is to lose weight. Uh, number three, uh, kind of surprising to me, was to get organized. Apparently, we're maybe a bunch of slobs uh, that uh, are, have, were hoarding stuff. Uh, and number four was to learn a new skill or hobby. I like number five because it kind of covers the waterfront. Uh, to live life to the fullest. Uh, that's probably a good one for all the time. Uh, as a uh, treasurer, CFO, the, the next one, uh, number five or number six, is to save more and spend less. This speaks to my soul, you know, although I'm not as uh, all that good at doing it myself. But <laughs> Number uh, seven is to be healthier. So, uh, you know, a lot of people resolve to change their lifestyle, maybe to quit smoking if you if you do that. Uh, spend more time with family and friends is number eight, and the last two are travel more and read more. So I don't know if any of those hit your resolutions, uh, but uh, whatever resolutions you made, how you doing on those, you know? <laughs> well, I, I found out that uh, last Friday, the 10th of January, is the date statistically when our New Year's resolutions start to crumble. We don't even make it 10 days, you know? And, and by mid-February, 80% of most Americans have already given up. They've quit. Now, I, I must say I can appreciate that. You know, over the years, I've made lots of resolutions, um, New Year's and otherwise, uh, and, and most, quite frankly, involve losing weight and exercising more. Uh, my latest effort, I've, I've been at that for a, a while, uh, for a few months. Uh, I've lost some weight. I do it, you know, by eating healthier, duh, and by exercising. Uh, I try to walk and, and do some other things. So uh, that one is uh, uh, is going better, but I covet your prayers on that. You know, exercising and, and, and weight loss and, and improving your health, all those 
are really great resolutions, right? Because they, they can lead to a longer life. But, you know, our questions is probably more to the point, does it lead to an abundant life? Does it, do they lead to an eternal life? What, what resolutions would do that? As important as getting organized or, or traveling or reading are, they, you know, I don't think they come close to addressing the problems, the issues that we are experiencing in our nation and in our church and in our lives. And I, I see 2020 shaping up to be a year of change, perhaps chaotic and, and uncomfortable change and challenges. You know, one of the things I take solace in, though, is that sometimes it's good when you have issues and challenges. It's good to know you're not alone. It's good to know that you're not the only one that's gone through this, right? And, and you know, in, in really broad terms, things haven't changed that much in the last two to 3,000 years. You know, this, the situation in Jerusalem 2,800 years ago in general, was not all that different from the challenges and problems that we are facing today. You know, there, there was an ever-increasing disparity of, of wealth between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, Israel and, and Judea had entered into unwise alliances with other nations around them, uh, ones that probably weren't the best to do, but they, they were trying to keep the Assyrian terrorists at bay. See, Micah is writing this at, at about 2800 BC, about the same time as Isaiah. The Assyrians have swept down from the north and they have captured Israel, the nation of Israel, Samaria, the capital, and they are knocking at the door of Jerusalem. Now, it won't be for another hundred or so years that the, until the Babylonians finally take it, but they are in deep trouble. And, and in, in light of that, though, we find that the leadership, the kings of Israel are ineffectual, if not downright oblivious. And the situation in the, among the common people, that there is injustice, especially for the least, the last, and the lost. That, it was rampant injustice. And so it is to that situation that the prophet Micah speaks telling the leaders, the, the pillars of society, the, the people in power in Jerusalem, this can't go on. This, this situation is unsustainable and untenable. And he does that by reminding the Judeans of all that God has done for them. And despite all that God has done, he says, you still are ungrateful people. You're not living faithfully to the plan that God has for you. And whether it's 2,800 years ago or today, I'm here to tell you that unfaithfulness can result in great difficulties. Now, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds a little bit familiar. Now, because we know, do we not, what God has done for us. We know that everything comes from God. He know, we know that he wants us to have life abundantly, and that abundant life comes only by being all in for Jesus Christ. We know. We believe all this. We say, yet we too often tend to live our Lives as if it weren't true, if, as if we can do anything we want without consequence. We know that what Paul said is true, that we have fallen short of the glory that God intends for us. We know that there are thousands of children dying every day from poverty-related diseases that we could probably fix if we but had the will to do so. We know that discrimination, 
and racism and bigotry and misogyny seem to be getting worse rather than better. We know. The Judeans knew. So they ask, what can we do? What can we do to, to please God? To, we, we've gone astray and we need to make this right. What, what do we need to do? What resolution, resolutions do we need to make? What, what changes do we need to make in our lives? And, and then they say, well, maybe, it's, maybe we just aren't doing enough. Or what kind of con, uh, uh, acceptable offering will you... Do you want God? Do you, do you want burnt offerings, uh, year-old calves, rams, rivers of oil? My firstborn? <laughs> to that, Micah says, no, no. You got it all wrong. He he, God doesn't want any of those things. He's more interested in the way you live your daily lives than in religious practices. What does the Lord require? Pretty simple. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly with God. Do justice. Love kindness. Walk humbly with God. You know, that was a pretty good to-do list for the people of Jerusalem, and I would suggest that those might be some great New Year's resolutions that we should seriously consider as well. So, if you will, I'd like to just unpack those uh, just a little bit further this morning. The first resolution is to do justice. Again, you, it helps sometimes to go to the original language, in this case Hebrew, and, and the word used here is mispate, which, uh, again, it, it's more of a concept. It, it's not some ideological expression. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not about wishing for justice or, or complaining because it isn't there. The concept that Micah is trying to get across is that God's people are to work for fairness and equality for all, particularly for the weak and the powerless. Now, I, I sense that sometimes our society kind of turns a blind eye towards the weak and the powerless. You know, we see them, you know, we can see the homeless on the streets of Lubbock, but sometimes we really don't see them, right? You know, because I think sometimes we consciously or subconsciously think that maybe the reason people are homeless is because of poor life decisions. Or, or that people receiving welfare are inherently lazy or that immigrants want to take our jobs. And, and while there might be elements of truth in those attitudes, for the most part, those go against the very vision that, that was captured in the line of our National Creed, the Pledge of Allegiance, which states that our nation is one that is dedicated to providing liberty and justice for all. But not only is this a part of our National Creed, but it's also an essential part of our Methodist doctrine. John Wesley said that you can't separate personal holiness from social holiness. So to bifurcate personal and socially, social holiness is to separate something that, according to John Wesley, founder of the Methodist movement, is inseparable. To be a Christ follower, Methodist or not, is to be concerned for justice and mercy for the vulnerable, the weak, the marginalized, the poor. I mean, think, what did Jesus say at the final judgment? How, how are we to be judged? It's going to be based upon our treatment of these people, right? Providing food for the hungry, water for the thirsty, clothes for the naked, visiting the sick and the imprisoned, welcoming the foreigner. So, I think we need a resolve to do justice. Our second resolution is to love kindness. Now, as Sally talked about it, you know, some translation will say love mercy or do mercy. Because the word here that is used is hesed. It's, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word which 
is used many times throughout the Bible. And, and the problem is that, again, that, you know, the original language doesn't always translate well into to, uh, English. It, it, it's just one word doesn't really do it justice. So hesed has to do with love and loyalty and faithfulness. To bring it home, it has said is, is the key element in relationships, whether it be between friends or in a marriage or between God and humanity. See, what it, we're trying to say here is that it's not enough to adhere to the terms of a contract or a covenant or, uh, you know, rules out of duty or, or fear or, or punishment or, or, you know, threat of co- or coercion. Now, what, what it means to, is to love kindness, is to love God as we, and to love one another. You know, I don't know if you've ever asked this, but uh, I would say if you were, if somebody said, what, tell me what this Christianity all, is all about. Tell me what the Bible is all about. And if they only gave you one word, what would that word be? Well, for me, it would be love. That word would be love. See, what did Jesus say? The two great commandments are that you would love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your being, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second one was like it is to love your neighbor as yourself. See, I think that's the essential theme of Christianity, love of God and love of neighbor, love expressed by doing to others what you would want them to do to you. The Apostle Paul, I mean, he carried this through. We know that in his letter to the Corinthians, he said that without love, one is merely a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. And they went on in that 13th chapter to say that of the tenets of faith and hope and love, love is the greatest. Peter wrote that we are to love one another deeply, and John in his first letter says that whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, the the love we are talking about, uh, in Greek we would call that agape. It's, It's a selfless love. It's not just this warm and fuzzy feeling. It's, it's a way of living. It means seeing the best in others. It means listening to what they have to say, whether you agree with them or not. Love one another means blessing and encouraging, caring for and serving others. You know, that's the essence of what Micah is is saying, is to love kindness. Finally, we are to resolve to walk humbly with our God. Again, I think to live into this resolution, we need to unpack the language a bit. The, The word humbly could be translated as wisely. So we are to walk wisely or or carefully. But the key word is not so much the humbly, it it is the word walk, halik in Hebrew. We are to walk with God as our constant companion, to be careful to put God first and and to live in conformity to God's will. (laughs) So what is God's will? Well, that's the subject of a whole different sermon. But I think, again, if you want to put it in a nutshell, Here's what Paul said. Here's what he told the Thessalonians. He said, God's will is to rejoice always. God's will is to pray without ceasing. God's will is to give thanks in all circumstances. So what does it mean to walk with God? It it, it means talking with God through prayer. It means being grateful for God's blessings, being in God's word through reading and studying the scripture, and being in God's presence through worship and small groups and Sunday school. All of this, of which I think is a lifelong journey. And and during this journey, 
here's what I've discovered, and maybe you have as well, that God's plan for your life is not so much a, a pre-written manuscript already completed down to the most minute of details, but it's more of an idea and an outline for a story that God hopes we will choose to follow. Doing justice, loving, walking. You know, all these are things we are to do, but friends, I'd be remiss, I think, if I left you with the impression that we have to do anything to curry God's favor. You know, this may have been where Micah was going 800 years before Christ, this theology of retribution, but I don't think that's where we should end up today. I'd point you toward Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where he, where he tells them and he tells us that God created us in the image of Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. See, I think Paul is telling us that the simple truth is that God's primary way of working in the world is through us, you and me. But what Paul was not saying, he was not saying that we are saved by our works, what we do. Now, what did he say? It's by grace, through faith, that you are saved. So I, I think this is an important relationship that we we really have to come to grips with. We've got to understand that good works, works of justice and kindness and, and mercy and service all are our response to God's saving grace and a means of growing in grace and living as God called us to live. So while we might resolve to do justice and to love kindness and to walk with God, I think we, we, we don't really want to construct so much of a to-do list. It's not something that we do. It's, it's who we are. It's about being. It's about being available to be used by God. It means saying, as did Isaiah and as did Mary, here I am, Lord. Use me as you will. I'm yours. I'm available. I love this story that Adam Hamilton has in his latest book, The Walk. It's the story of a man named Kevin Hines. Kevin went to the Golden Gate Bridge one day to, he was intent on jumping from the bridge into the waters of San Francisco Bay at 750 feet below. And if you jump into water, even water, it's from 750 feet, you're most likely going to die. As he began walking across the bridge, he became conflicted. He, he told himself that if even one person looked at him or smiled, he would not jump. But no one smiled, which reinforced the idea to Kevin that no one cared. So Kevin jumped. He tells that the moment his body left the bridge, he regretted it. You see, he was one of the lucky few who survived to tell about it. But did you get the point of the story? Is that just one simple act of kindness, being available just to smile at a stranger, might change everything. Sisters and brothers, I pray that this day you will resolve to be instruments of God's mercy. God's love, God's kindness, God's grace, and God's peace. See, that, that can change everything. Amen. The ushers will come forward and we'll receive our tithes and our offerings. Let us pray. <coughs> 
love you, Lord, because we know that you have given us everything. Everything that we have come to you. You've allowed us to use this to your honor and your glory. So as we give of ourselves this day, we pray that this offering will be just that. An offering to your honor and your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Sing in response in Christ alone and sing all four verses. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still and striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he
No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first try to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of men can ever pluck me from his hand. To me, no scheme of men can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Or calls me home here in the power of Christ. I'll stand. Well, here in the power of Christ, we stand. So, hear this these words of comfort, these words of benediction, I'm going to speak. Go. With that power of Christ, I hope you will go to do justice, to love kindness, to love everyone, and to walk with God. This day and all. Amen. 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 Spirit, be my